and the British. The Gentleman Amateur. The early 1960s saw the beginnings of a new era in British sport. In a more open and egalitarian age, Britain's establishment was scrutinised, criticised and satirised. Peter Cook named his comedy club The Establishment, just to make the point. In this climate, it wasn't surprising that Britain's sporting establishment should come under fire. Dr Dilwyn Porter. By the late 50s, early 60s, Uh, The British establishment and much of the custom and practice and the conventions that the British establishment was seen to uphold were looking very out of date and sometimes not fit for purpose. And uh, this was particularly the case in cricket. County cricket attendances were plummeting. Particularly bad summer in 1959 seemed to bring a, a sense of crisis to the game. England's test performances were disappointing and this put the governing body of English cricket, the Marylebone Cricket Club, founded in 1787, under great pressure to modernise what was essentially the most traditional of English sports. This is the story of how the MCC came to abandon the long-standing distinction between gentlemen and players or amateurs and professionals. In practice, the distinction had blurred for some time before the MCC decided to abandon it from the start of the 1963 season. But looking at the career of the Reverend David Shepherd, who represented Cambridge University, Sussex and England, you'll see that a gentlemanly cricketer, provided he was good enough, could still make an impact. Walking down the length of the long room is something that anyone can do now if they come on a tour to Lords, and even I can do as a woman, because for many years, access to this room was restricted not just to men, but to gentlemen. And you might assume that a gentleman is a man of manners and morality, but for a long time, it was means more than manners that mattered. A gentleman could afford to play cricket for fun. A player, on the other hand, needed to be paid and that division in status was clearly marked by the Marylebone Cricket Club based here at Lords, the governing body of cricket. So how did the MCC, the staunchest traditionalists in the land, find themselves at the forefront of breaking down the class barriers? Why were they lauded by the leader of the opposition, Harold Wilson, just a year before he became Prime Minister? For the commanding heights of British industry, to be controlled today by men whose only claim is their aristocratic connection or the power of inherited wealth or speculative finance is as irrelevant to the 20th century as would be the continued purchase of commissions in the armed forces by lordly amateurs. (laughs) At the very time that even the MCC has abolished the distinction between amateurs and professionals In science and in industry, we are content to remain a nation of gentlemen in a world of players. Harold Wilson, speaking at the Labour Party conference in October 1963, a year after the MCC had made its breakthrough decision. He chose to mention the MCC because those three letters embodied the attitudes of the Conservative elite. And if they could change, well, anyone could. Looking at the portraits here in the long room, you get the most incredible sense of tradition and status. And the MCC represented the old ways of Victoriana. To some, that meant the strength of the empire. To others, it meant an unwieldy, rusty old ship. And in the 1950s, when angry young men like John Osborne and Kingsley Amos were agitating for change, it seemed out of kilter. As always in sport, results will out. And when England lost to Australia in the 1950-51 Ashes series, the cricket correspondent of the London Evening News wrote, I am convinced that the MCC is not and cannot be the ideal body to run English international cricket in these modern times. The very character of the club, traditional and slow-moving, which is a virtue in its role as the game's lawmaker, is a severe handicap in other respects. I've come into the home dressing room here at Lords, where the England players would sit on the black leather benches around the side or lie on the physio's table for treatment. It's very simple, 
But one thing you take for granted is that they all share the same dressing room. Of course they do. Well, it wasn't always like that because in the counties, the division between gentlemen and professionals was really pronounced through the 50s and 60s. They would have separate dressing rooms and they'd have different hotel arrangements when they went on tour. Doug Insull, himself a former president here of the MCC, was an amateur cricketer for Essex and England. I thought the amateur was able to give quite a bit to the game by virtue of being independent. If he was a good cricketer, I mean, you think of people like John War and, and uh, Wilfred Waller and Peter Richardson and Charlie Palmer, they had an enormous amount of cricketing knowledge, which the committee hadn't got. When it went, it, it was necessary that it went. But prior to 1960-ish, I thought, and most of the big professional cricketers, thought that the amateur was worthwhile in the game. Stepping out from the dressing room onto the tiny player's balcony, I'm looking down on the pitch where Fred Truman would have bowled many an over. Fred Truman was a fast bowler extraordinaire. He was described by Harold Wilson as the greatest living Yorkshireman and he was given the nickname Fiery Fred because of his temper. He was very much a professional player. He was frequently in opposition with the cricket establishment. He accused them of snobbishness and hypocrisy and he was dropped from England on occasions because of it. In the tribute he wrote to Colin Cowdery, who played as an amateur throughout his life and to Captain Truman in various England test matches, Fred wrote, We got on well together, even though to many we may have cut very different figures. I only had to reprimand him once when he turned and called me Truman. I asked him never to address me in that way again or there would be trouble, and he never did. The captaincy of England and of most of the counties had been the preserve of the gentleman amateur. Even if, as at Kent, where the whole team refused to play for the amateur captain, he was inferior as a player and a leader, the gentleman would still have a head start over the rest. In 1925, the Yorkshire Club president and old guard of the MCC had stated, Pray God no professional shall ever captain England. Even if that man was a professional and had to become an amateur to do so, it seemed all right. And walking back into the dressing room, there's a name on this board of test hundreds that appears twice in 1937 and 1938. W.R. Hammond, Wally Hammond. He had resigned his professional status and reverted to being an amateur so that he could be captain of England. But he was bankrolled by a company called Marsham Tyres and even Hammond recognised the hypocrisy of the situation. I captained England after most of my life being a professional. I was the same man as before. Because I could change my label, all was well. I submit this is illogical. Technically, then, no professional captained England until 1952, when the opening batsman Len Hutton was the obvious choice. Publicly, Hutton expressed his pleasure, but privately, he was concerned about the welcome he might receive from the cricket establishment. Would Lords, the citadel of tradition, accept me, the symbol of radical change? I always anticipated a minority opposition from the dyed-in-the-wool traditionalists, and it duly came. A few scars remain. Hutton more than earned his place here in the museum at Lord's, the home of cricket, not just for being the first professional England captain, but for winning the Ashes for the first time in 20 years and for the first time on home soil since 1926. There were still, though, reservations about whether he should captain England on tour to the West Indies. He did, with the help of a player manager, and they drew the series. But Hutton's health was suffering. The travelling, the intensity of his play and his long hours at the crease were taking their toll. In 1954, he missed a month of cricket on medical advice and a young amateur called David Shepherd was appointed captain in his place. Shepherd had been educated at Sherburne and Cambridge where he broke all records for runs scored. He was very much the classic English gentleman, but the Reverend David Shepherd was different from his amateur contemporaries because Shepherd was not a master. He was a servant to God. God knows what he's doing with you and that the right thing to do is often to stay in the position and, and the life that you're in now and to get on with it and bring Christ into it and try to learn what he wants you to do mm. in it 
until he may call you out to do something else. And I felt very strongly for some years God wanted me to go on playing cricket, to try to play it as well as I could, to try to sometimes to speak of my faith to other people within the game, and so on. And so Shepherd captained England against Pakistan for two test matches while Len Hutton recovered from illness. When he returned home, he got back to the business of being a vicar and was ordained into the Church of England in 1955. He became the first ordained minister to play cricket for England and despite limited appearances on the county circuit, he continued to play test cricket until 1963. David Shepherd may have represented much that the MCC desired in a cricketer, but he was a man of strong principles. He refused to captain the Duke of Norfolk's eleven against a South African side in 1960 because of his opposition to apartheid. He also had severe doubts about the continued division between the professionals in cricket and the gentlemen amateurs. He wrote, The strongest part of the case for retaining the distinctive status of amateur was that it is good to have players, and particularly a captain, who are independent-minded. Despite ribbing from Fred Truman for dropping catches during a test match in Australia, kid yourself it's Sunday, Rev, and keep your hands together, Shepherd was well-liked and much respected. His story had a nostalgic, romantic feel to it as the vicar took to the crease. Having played 22 test matches, he retired from international cricket and focused on his clerical career becoming Bishop of Woolwich in 1969 and Bishop of Liverpool six years later. And it's because of him that this must be the only cricket museum in the world that has Bishop's regalia in one of its displays, the cope, mitre and stole belonging to the Right Reverend Lord Shepherd of Liverpool. He was devout, extremely even-handed, a very good sportsman, could be extremely obstinate, but was generally extremely well thought of and well liked in the game. I had a mate in Essex called Frank Rist, who was our coach, a man whose name very few people would recognise. David was in the East End, and Frank was getting married, and I said to David, is there any chance you'd come and do the job? And he said, absolutely delighted. Always like Frank. And there he was, among a load of mixed East End footballers and cricketers and, and haves and have-nots, uh, tying the knot for him. A thoroughly good bloke. On a part eight, well, that was just something that he felt went beyond the pale as far as sporting involvement was concerned, so he was quite vehemently anti. Doug Insole talking about David Shepherd, whose last appearance in a test series came just after the MCC had decided to abandon the gentlemen versus players matches that had so underlined the division between the cricket playing classes. Great amateurs continued to play for England, but it was no longer beneath them to be considered professional. In fact, the meaning was beginning to shift. To be professional was to be committed, well-practiced and focused. To be amateur was no longer a compliment and would eventually become something of an insult. (laughs) 